Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to start our final unit of the year on solutions. And so some of this will seem like a bit of a review for the longtime viewers out there, uh, but I'll try to make sure that we hit on all the big parts that we've talked about already. So we've got, of course, some new friends to help us out here. <laughs> I think I'm going to like these two. All right, so solution chemistry, really the basic idea, let's, let's refine and uh, redefine some definitions we might have talked about before. Solution, again, is just a homogeneous mixture uniformly distributed throughout. The solvent is doing the dissolving. The solvent is being, solute is being dissolved. It's the thing being intermingled. Uh, typically, uh, a lot of solutions are aqueous, meaning they're dissolved in water, but there are, of course, plenty other solvents out there that are non-aqueous. So we'll, we'll run through a couple um, solutions here and talk about some of the different things, like, for instance, air. What do you think air is? That's right, air is, in, air is a gas. The solvent would be the thing there's the most of, which would be the uh, homonuclear di uh, diatomic nitrogen, and anything else would be dissolved in there. Uh, I picked out antifreeze. Antifreeze is a liquid, water, and then you've got your ethylene glycol there. Don't drink it. It'll taste sweet, but it will blind you. I'm not even sure that many people are using ethylene glycol anymore. Brass is a solid uh, solution. One of the copper, there's more copper than there is zinc. Um, carbonated water, again, is a liquid. Uh, water is also the solvent in this case. Uh, this time the solvent would be, or solute, would be carbon dioxide. Sugar is another, sugar water is another example, pretty obvious, where the liquid is sugar and the solid solute would be the sugar. So, uh, really it comes down to dissolving a simple idea, or <laughs> remembering a simple idea, is the idea of like dissolves like. Um, and, and, and for those of you who've been following along, it's the idea of polar things like to like other polar things and nonpolar things like nonpolar things. And so things with partial charges tend to like other things with partial charges. So let's take a look. And so, for instance, if you have an unequal distribution of charge like a polar molecule, then you are going to like other things with partial distributions of charge or full distributions of charge. And so uh, polar molecules are going to be quite happy interacting with ions, just as they'd be interacting with any other polar substance. It'll be a dipole force or even a hydrogen bond, depending on the makeup. Um, so for instance, you know, if we take water molecules, uh, you could have water interacting with uh, different parts of different ions and so the partially positive part of water would love to be around a negative ion like chloride and so not a lot of people use this term but solvation would be the idea of the physical dissolution of stuff uh, by a solvent and as the ions dissolve they get spread out and become surrounded by the solvent molecules you know, sort of like think of like a zombie movie where somebody's standing by a window of course they inevitably get pulled out the window and carried off into a sea of zombies it's it's kind of the same thing um the bigger the ion uh the more solvent molecules can get around it just like more more uh zombies can get around a big guy and then uh, the higher the charge, the more solvent molecules get attracted to it. And I guess if you're into uh, 80s zombie uh, genre, then perhaps uh, your brains are bigger and they want to eat your brains. So. so the idea of being hydrated is to be surrounded by water molecules, just like being, I guess, zombated would be to be surrounded by zombies. And so here we go. We've got a, 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 a frightening yet terrifyingly accurate example of what it's like to be uh, hydrated. So let's take a closer look here. Had your favorite, like, uh, maybe Jaws theme song music here. There's your add the buzz saw noise right here as they cut that guy free. Again, cue buzz sound, buzz saw. <laughs> That was, that was pretty frightening. That was pretty frightening. And so you see what happens where um, the water molecules got in and the positive parts of the water molecules went after the negative ions and the negative parts went after the positive ions. 
And so when those water molecules get in, they can overcome the crystal lattice there. If it's a soluble salt, that is. Now, you don't always have to be an ion to dissolve in a polar solvent, as we've talked about before. You just have to have unequal distribution of charge. So water molecules can dissolve sugar, not because sugar is ionic, but because sugar has partially positive and partially negative parts of it. Uh, and there are hydroxyl groups in sugar molecules. And so if you look at this picture, these are water molecules up there, and they are, they are hydrating that sh these sugar molecules right there. I'm going to get hold of them. Look over to the right and you'll see that one sugar molecule getting totally surrounded by water molecules. And so a couple other things I wanted to point out today. Um, you know, we want to point out nonpolar. Uh, nonpolar solvents are considered uh, immiscible, or I guess solutes Maybe the case may be if there's not as many of them. Uh, water is simply not that interested in interacting with the London dispersion force available. And so they tend to separate out. Um, so they will tend to sink or float depending on their densities. Uh, but they will end up uh, interacting with other uh, nonpolar solvents. Sort of like, you know, in every teen movie, there's like the loser table in, uh, you know, the cafeteria where all the uh, rejects all kind of drift together and then, of course, become good friends and save the school or something. Um, again, but they came together not because they had a strong attraction to each other, but because everybody else really had a stronger attraction to everybody else, and so they were sort of left behind. And that's how nonpolar things sort of work. Because remember, they only have London dispersion forces between themselves. But if that's all they can have, then they'll take it, you know, as opposed to a stronger force. And so dry cleaners actually use nonpolar solvents to help remove the nonpolar stains. If you just try to wash out like oil or dirt and water, it might not come out. Um, because again, you, you're dealing with the polar water and the nonpolar other things like oil and grease. And that's why dry cleaners use things like perc, perchloroethylene. Or uh, I, I know that uh, some dry cleaners are starting to use liquid carbon dioxide. Of course, it'd have to be above five atmospheres of pressure. Uh, but again, that's you know a, a nice alternative. I mean, if it leaks, then you're just putting out carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, but um, isn't going to uh, be as dangerous as some of that other stuff. And so detergents work. The reason if you don't have a dry cleaner in your basement, <laughs> the reason you put detergents in your dish uh, in your uh, washing machine is the fact that, or your dishwasher, is that they have both a polar and a nonpolar part of the molecule. And so the nonpolar part of the molecule will end up interacting with the nonpolar stains, and the polar part will interact with the water. Um, and that way, uh, you can get the oils onto the detergent, and the detergent will still interact with the water. If you just put in an oily detergent, then it would just kind of get stuck on the clothes and wouldn't go away, and things would be worse than what you started with. So go detergent. Finally, the last thing I wanted to introduce is, is uh, you know, it, it sounds like sci-fi. It's just one of those things that a lot of courses never get to. But there's a lot of information out there on the internet on this. Um, you know, ions, ions form crystal lattices because the positive and negative ions can form together and lock in. But here's an interesting scenario. What happened if you had really gigantic polyatomic cations? <laughs> so big that they could not neatly arrange. Imagine instead of trying to arrange uh, tennis balls and golf balls, you were trying to arrange tennis balls and Christmas trees. Like you're just not gonna get them to stack together. And so here's the interesting thing is if the ions can ever pack together, they will remain disorganized. They can't form the crystal lattice because they just simply can't make it work. They don't fit together. And so in other words, uh, you could have an ionic compound that would actually remain a liquid at room temperature, which is a crazy idea, but they exist. They've actually existed for decades. Um, now, there's a lot of neat things about liquid ionics. Uh, they would give off very uh, few fumes because they'd have extremely low vapor pressures. Um, and they'd be potentially less hazardous because of uh, the ability to uh, reclaim the solvent, which is a pretty neat idea. Um, and so really, ionic... Uh, solutions, liquid ionics, really have the idea to revolutionize every single pro process in chemistry. Because think of all the processes in chemistry that were designed for centuries around water. But uh, water being a polar solvent is nice, but imagine what happens if you put something in a, in a ionic solvent, which is crazy to think about. And so just, you know, I just threw it out there. I'm sure you can find a lot more interesting stuff on the internet, but there could technically be ionic solvents um, that, that could be at, exist at room temperature. So, pretty neat stuff. So, uh, anyway, I just wanted to introduce some of the basic ideas of solutions. Uh, next time, we'll talk about uh, some of the units, mainly focusing on molarity. 
which is by far the most important uh, unit for solutions. So thanks for watching and have a great day.